Stanford University. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I've been back on campus for 12 years, I guess, since those early days and when I was on the advisory committee at the Earth Sciences School. A lot has happened, but I must tell you how impressed I am by GSEP. Just sitting through the day, uh, a lot of energy about energy, which is obviously a, a very important subject to me. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to review the National Academy study, which Jim and I uh, participate in. We'll have a handoff here, and that's why he's sitting there. He wants to make sure I don't jump off of the stage or something, I guess. Um, this study, which was part of the America's Energy Future study, which was reviewed this morning, really was to answer the question, what role can bi biomass and coal play producing low carbon fuels in this country? And what will it look like over a period of time? And what kind of impact can it have on reducing US oil demand and also reducing greenhouse gases, again, with low carbon fuels? Um, it's uh, uh, a very important part of this is that, and it's on these studies, it's always important. We're not looking for the impact of a little bit of biomass to fuels. We're talking about a, whether a lot of biomass can be converted to liquid fuels and whether a lot of coal can be converted to liquid fuels. So in the end, you have a large impact on society. And that's sort of the scope of this. <coughs> Again, it's part of the America's Energy Future study that was done. And uh, we were an independent panel. And uh, Chancellor uh, right, uh, right then today discussed the overall study. But we were a separate panel of 16 people uh, we did a typical NRC study, and then the results of that were extracted and put into the overall study. I think I'll put my glasses on here so I can see. Uh, is there a pointer? Oh, yes. You, would you like? I've got one here. Oh, yeah. I have one. This one has a button on it. This one has a button. Ah, they got it. Ah, it's easy to read from here. Okay. Um, in all of these NRC studies, there is a basic charge to the panel, which is called the statement of task. And the charge to our panel was to evaluate technologies for converting biomass and coal to liquid fuels that would be deployable by 2020. Deployable by 2020 is a very important aspect because not only will it f cause us to look at ethanol, it will also lead to the point that it will give us other ideas and leads that we need to address from a research standpoint. And I'll bring those out and actually tie into some of the other presentations today. We were asked to uh, look at the current and projected cost uh, and uh, CO2 emissions from fuels from biomass and coal to identify key R&D areas that were needed in order to get there and, and what was the technically feasible supply. Other words, not the supply that might be deployed, but how much theoretically can be made from the biomass or coal in general, to making low zero uh, carbon fuels. And primarily we focused on zero carbon fuels, close to zero carbon fuels. Then we were supposed to estimate the potential supply. So there's a difference in this study between deployable, which is technically feasible, and deployment, which is a supply curve, which is possible over a period of time. So I can look in 2035 and say, how much liquid fuel could I really have and how much of an impact would it have on CO2 and oil? We were also supposed to evaluate the environmental and economic and policy issues, really focusing on what are the key barriers to getting what kind of impact we believe we can get out of these fuels. And finally is to review, and, and I'll briefly mention some alternatives uh, that are not deployable between 2020. And there's no policy recommendations in this study. I think some of the policy recommendations will be obvious once you look at some of the economics that Jim's going to show later on all of this. But we were, we were actually, this is, the, there's actually another phase of the American Energy Future Study, which is actually going to look at policy issues, and that's coming next. 
This was a very interesting committee. Uh, I've uh, been on a number of NRC committees since I retired seven years ago, chaired several of them. It's a very diverse committee. They're environmental scientists, they're agriculturals, ecologists, chemical engineers, civil, civil engineers, all to address this issue because when you're really looking at coal and biomass to a transportation fuel, you're looking at a system, a total integrated system. So there's a, there's a variety of people. Jim and I have actually done this several times together now, so we actually know how to communicate well on these studies. Uh, let me just give you the bottom line, and uh, Mark showed this this morning. I'll put a little more emphasis on it. The bottom line results of the study said that there are about 500 million tons a year of biomass of, will be available in the United States by 2020 uh, that can be produced sustainably without interfering with food production either from livestock or grains or creating carbon debit by turning land turnover can be produced in 2020 to make biofuels. Uh, and I'll discuss some of the barriers of doing that. If that is done, the theoretical, it's theoretically possible, uh, in a supply, you know, let me back up, in a supply standpoint, it's, the, it's possible to produce two to three million barrels a day of low carbon to zero carbon fuels out of that 550 million tons and and also with some coal in it. Uh, that's a very important number. And if you look at U.S. oil production today, or oil demand, 20 million barrels a day, 12 million barrels a day used in transportation, uh, about 12 million barrels a day imported. So, so I'll come back to this later, but two to three million barrels a day might not sound like a lot, but it really is a lot when you compare it and combine it with other things that can go on in the transportation sector. And finally, um, the timely commercial deployment of this uh, will require policy actions uh, by some administration and hopefully a sustained energy policy that will promote a diverse portfolio of energy options for this country in the future. Now let me talk a little bit about the panel's approach to this. And um, I think it's important for me to go back and talk about this is a system. It's a system of, of growing biomass. It's a system of, of mining coal, transporting coal, transporting biomass, converting it, and then taking the, and then taking the uh, uh, products to final use to put in some vehicle. Uh, when we started this study, Sort of what we found was that if people looked at the biomass supply side, they assumed they would get 100 gallons uh, a ton of ethanol out of it. And the people who did the bioconversion piece of it uh, all assumed that biomass was $60 a ton and they could get a billion tons of it, like was in the billion ton DOE study. So we took a different approach in this because the data was extremely variable when we looked at data across the board. We basically decided to model these systems ourselves through consultants. And um, we estimated the supply and cost of different cellulosic biomass feedstocks. We did not look at grain, uh, either to ethanol or anything else, because a lot of work has been done on that. Also, a lot of people in the committee, it's actually not a very sustainable uh, fuel, even though uh, the uh, re renewable fuel standard is going to have, us, have a lot of green alcohol in our system. Uh, we looked at the uh, biochemical and uh, thermochemical conversion, bio biochemical conversion of biomass, the thermochemical conversion of biomass, combinations of biomass and coal, and coal. And, I'll, and I'll, what I'm going to do is sort of go through how we did that. But particularly important in this analysis is the combination of 60% coal, 40% biomass on an energy basis, which allows you to get ultimately to zero carbon fuels and gasify that material. So you have bioconversion of biomass, 
You have thermochemical conversion of combinations of biomass and coal, and then you have thermochemical coal, and I'm going to discuss the technologies. And remember, the questions again is, what is deployable by 2020? And let me just reemphasize what deployable means. It means that the technology will be commercially demonstrated, as we heard discussed this morning. There'll be enough commercial demonstrations, plants, or whatever that technology is, that will know the optimized cost that investors, whether they're small or large, will say, this is the business opportunity, and they'll start building world-scale plants. Because what commercial demonstrations do for you is they bring your costs down because they, learn you to, they teach you to optimize your capital, and they teach you how to operate the plants and figure out how to feed biomass in one of these and all those other things, and that takes a period of time. So by 2020, that technology would be deployable if they'd gone through that process. The next part of the panel's approach then, and Jim's going to talk about this and the economics, is once we had modeled the biomass supply, the biomass cost, the bioconversion, and the thermochemical conversion of biomass, we need to pull it together as a system so we can compare economics and CO2 on a common basis. Some of these things, I think, really haven't been done in this way before. And then we, uh, from that, we could estimate the amount of fuels that were deployable or technical feasible by 2020 and by 2035. And then we could estimate the market penetration of this. And so this is the pieces of this that we're going to take you through now. Uh, so first, let me go to um, biomass supply. Uh, Biomass supply, again, when we estimated types of biomass, which I'll show you in just a second, whether they're grasses, whether they're woody biomass, or whether they're, um, they're waste or municipal waste, we estimated the amount that we thought was currently available, and then we projected from that the amount that would be available in 2020. We also looked forward. Again, we're looking at biomass that would not create carbon, debit, it will not interfere with food production, um, and that it will not, for example, carbon debit, most of you know, but if you actually take an existing field that has had agriculture on it or wood, and you actually turn it all up and plant dedicated grasses on it, you turn the roots all up, those roots all disintegrate to the air, and guess what they happen? They cause CO2. And so we were very careful not to use land, which we thought was going to cause land change turnover or which would interfere with either agriculture or, or crops. One of the main sources of agriculture is corn stover. And we looked at the amount of corn stover that we would thought was available from currently, but we did more than that. We actually analyzed how much corn stover we really thought would have to be left in place in order to maintain soil so you wouldn't have erosion and so, you, and so you would also be able to, to maintain the water supply around the stover. And, uh, so that was, and so we actually looked at that. We also looked at dedicated fuel crops. And we looked at particularly biomass production from CRP land uh, in 2020, 2020, 24 million acres. This is really dedicated uh, perennial feed. This is macanthus, switchgrass, prairies that do not require tilling, grasses that require, that can be grown on minimal lands because they're very efficient from a nutrient standpoint, they're very efficient from a water use standpoint, and you don't have to, and they're, just, they're perennial. And, but, but, but to be grown on marginal lands, there's not a lot of marginal lands. In fact, of the 900 million acres in the U.S., today that's used for cropland, whether it's growing crops or whether it's pasture for livestock. There's only about 50 million acres of idle land in the United States. And so there's not a large abundance of dedicated crops. So we, that was the area we worked in. We looked at woody, woody biomass, primarily uh, um, waste. We did not use any biomass that was currently being used for paper pulp production. And we looked at, at hay and wheat straws. One thing that's important in this, and it applies to all of this, is we used historical yield improvements 
that have taken place agricultural industry, which take place for three reasons. One from genetic kind of modifications, with, which helps the traits, which makes things more uh, uh, tolerant to d disease and other things, from, from breeding increases and from agricultural practices. Those increases over the last 30 years have increased at about 2% a year. So we use a 2% growth rate in all of our analysis between 2020, now 2020, and 2035, and uh, you'll see that in our yields. Now, what do these supply assumptions look like? Uh, this is where we get, to, well, I said five, that's 550 million tons. Maybe make some comments. Um, you see the corn stover uh, going from 76 million tons to 112 million tons, part of the ag agricultural practice. When I come later to talk about barriers, I want to spend some time talking about what our committee really believes the difficulties of organizing this system is. This is a system itself, the agricultural system. Uh, dedicated crops on those 24 million acres of CRP or mar other marginal lands, uh, 164 million. Uh, uh, woody residues, about 124 million. Animal manure, what we used, most animal manure is used for fertilizer. We used 10%. We assumed we, somehow we could get 10%. And finally, we looked at municipal solid waste, which really hasn't been looked at. We looked, actually, at all the municipal solid waste in the United States. We extracted the organic part of that, uh, which is about 200 million uh, tons a year. And we assumed that we could probably get 100 million tons of that with some organized collection. And that grows because population grows. So we took a look at each of these types. Of now, these numbers, uh, for those that are familiar, every time I give this talk, particularly if DOE people are around, they ask me the question. There was a DOE, a famous DOE study called the Billion Ton Study that uh, people quote all the time that says there's over a billion tons a year uh, in fact, it's 1.2 billion tons a year of biomass available for being converted to liquid fuels. In fact, there was a Scientific American article uh, that, that was out lately that used that billion tons. Let me tell you a couple things why this differs from the billion ton study. First of all, the billion ton study had three sets of numbers in it. They had a current number, which was 220. They had a moderate number that was 700. And then they had some futuristic number, which was the billion, which got it quoted. But the biggest difference in that study than these numbers is the numbers for the combined corn stover, wheat, and hay, where they have almost three times as much biomass in those categories as we do, even in their moderate case. And these numbers are a lot, what I'm going to show you, the cost numbers are a lot higher than most other people have presented. And they're higher for a number of reasons. Uh, I can find a farmer that has a lot of has a lot of wheat straw that he can't get rid of and he might give it to me. I can also find people who have some incremental production they want to make some money on. All realistic. But in the end, for me to develop or for us to develop a sustainable, large biofuels industry that's going to supply a lot of plants, and I'm going to tell you later, for the biomass, it's 300, 400 biomass conversion plants that are going to have to be fed with biomass for 20 years to pay those plants back. You're going to have to have some sustained commitment, and you're going to have to have systems on a large scale to produce that. In the oil industry, we used to say that the price of oil, I don't think this was true anymore, but the, the, uh, the price of oil is priced for the last barrel produced. This model basically looks at the cost of the last biomass produced, which we think will set the price in a tight market. We looked at, you have to look at the report, 50 to 75 different studies that had been done, and we modeled the cost of biomass in those categories. And we, bought, we modeled the cost of nutrient replacement. And it's particularly important in new, in, in, in uh, in dedicated crops, macanthus and so forth, when you've got established new. We, look, we model the cost of harvesting and maintenance, which is $50 to $60 a ton across the board, which is, by the way, 
the total price that was assumed for biomass in the, in the billion ton study. We, we modeled the cost of transportation and storage for a 40 mile radius from the plant, which is actually a very important, ends up being a very important variable. Almost all studies look at a 40 mile radius. A 40 mile radius is 3 million acres. Think about how many, 3 million acres, that's 500 square miles, 5,000 square miles. Uh, transportation distance and yield become a very important factor in this. We did not vary that, but we looked at what was historically, and, and transportation cost is like $20 a, a ton. Seating, again, is very important. And finally, there's opportunity cost. And what an opportunity cost is, is I have, I have land, and I can produce something else on it or I cannot farm it properly, or if I get a CRP payment on it, I'm not gonna take it out. There's a cost I'm gonna to have to give up that somebody's gonna to have to pay is the alternative use for the land. Again, in a tight market of supply and demand. And when you put all those costs together, we developed a model, and actually what we did is we took the, the highest cost we could imagine and the lowest cost we could imagine by adding up all the stuff in the literature on these parameters and then we said, well, you know, probably the people that are the most expensive don't really know what they're doing. They're not paying much attention. The people who are pretty good must be in the middle. And the people who are really good and actually know what they're doing in some kind of organized fashion have the lowest cost. So we just took the, this is going to sound too simple for you, but we took the middle cost as the current, and we took 25% of the way toward the lowest cost. So this, and we're just scoping this out. But we're just trying to get, a, and we did this in all these areas, nutrients, CD, and so forth. You know, this is a sort of a scoping type of study, but we're trying to map out the cost. When you do this, what you see are these costs for biomass. Uh, you see corn stover at $110 a ton going to 86 and so forth, and macanthus, uh, mixed prairie grasses, um, the woody biomass, and the wheat straw. Again, these numbers are are high compared to most numbers, and they, uh, in the end, uh, two things about these numbers. They will become the dominant factor in bioconversion fuels. They will, be, they will be more of a cost factor, as Jim will show, than the conversion cost, and they become a major issue of whether this market can be developed and, whether the, and what will be the ultimate price of these biofuels. Um, uh, the, the second thing um, on all of this, and I want to address this on the next couple of slides, biomass availability becomes a very, very significant issue because how much biomass I have, I mean, it's very, it's very light, so it costs a lot to transport it. So how much density I have of biomass, what size plant I can build, whether it's a thermal conversion plant, whether it's a bioconversion plant, becomes issues that have not been optimized. We didn't optimize them, uh, but I can show you some numbers on scale that become a very important part of this. Now, the next thing I want to do is talk about bioconversion. No, no. This is a, uh, uh, th this actually puts the biomass cost and supply on a little different scale. And you can see the person is making a decision where they're gonna build a bioconversion plant and, and what their feedstock choice is and the availability of feedstock becomes a very important issue. And the waste is relatively cheap. Uh, uh, but you can see that these perennial grasses end up being very expensive. Uh, and so the person making the investment decision, uh, it becomes very important what their biomass choice is. Now let me talk about uh, bioconversion. Uh, I'm sure you all know this, but let me just repeat it. Biomass is basically ligand, hemicellulose, and cellulose. The bioprocesses, you gotta prep, prep it, you gotta actually pre-treat it. Uh, you gotta pull the ligand, the hemicellulose, and the cellulose apart uh, in pre-treatment. You have cellulase en enzymes that basically do the reaction. They get in, they break down the cellulose, the hemicellulose to glucose, uh, which is the starting point for other kinds of reactions in that glucose. And the xylose is converted by fermentation to, to ethanol. 
Uh, the key challenges facing this industry is not taking the glucose or not even taking the xylose and ferment, fermenting it. It's basically, first is the pretreatment, because if, the, if you can't have effective pretreatment, you can't get access, enzymes can't get access to the cellulose and the hemicellulose to convert them. That's number one. It's not the cost of the pretreatment, it's the effectiveness of the pretreatment. And the second thing is enzymes. And it's not only the cost of the enzymes, it's their effectiveness and their ability to handle the byproduct toxins that go along with the process because they get such a chemical, as an old chemical reaction engineer, very old chemical reaction engineer. Uh, basically, the process is a chemical reaction process and it, the enzyme being the catalyst and, the, and, and man. Those are the two really key factors uh, that are really important. And I guess the committee judged, uh, you know, looking at what's going on in industry, and we, we know there's a lot of commercial demonstration plants going on. Uh, we actually visited uh, the Iogen plant in Canada. Uh, Mascoma is another one. DOE has several. Certainly, this technology, we believe, will be deployable by 2020. Commercial demonstrations are going on now. And if you look in the detailed report, we basically concluded that where the technology is today, it will evolve to around 40% lower cost over the next number of years. And I'm going to show you some numbers on how we did that until it really gets to a fairly commercial point in 2020. Now, we're also to ask, you know, what about other technologies like uh, Professor Costa talked about earlier today? If you talk about catalytic routes, what do they start with? They start with sugar and they start with glucoses. Dr. Kessler's, Kessler's work today on using bacterial approaches started with sugars. Uh, that technology we did not look at because we did not think it was deployable, but it's obviously an extremely important, those areas, research areas for two reasons. First of all, ethanol is very, not very compatible, as you all know, with the current system. It's a very low density fuel is not compatible, uh, and to develop the, the distribution system for widespread use of ethanol when the ethanol is produced in the Midwest and it's all used on the coast is a very complex issue. So getting more compatible fuels, higher density fuels is, is, is very important. And the other thing, most of those fuels would be a lot cheaper in a way because the separation of ethanol from water in dilute phase is a very expensive part of this process. The last piece of this, we did not look at algae fuels. We, uh, 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 Ari Petraeus, who's the pr uh, president of Synthetic Genomics, um, at least runs the whole algae program, it was actually on our committee. Uh, we did a lot of talking about whether we should do, include algal fuels in this. Uh, and we decided that probably on the borderline, it was not a 2020 deployable fuel at a commercial level. Uh, but obviously, it's a very, very important. Photos, photosynthetic fuels are a very, very important part of the future. And so we weren't leaving that out because of all the reasons that uh, I think many people know. Uh, so let me just look at uh, some numbers. What I'm going to do on both the biochemical conversion and thermochemical conversion, I'm just going to show you some numbers of, of the, that resulted in the, in the modeling. You know, there's really three really key factors in getting the cost. Uh, from bioconversion. One is the cost of feedstock. The second is the scale. And the third is a choice of, of parameters. And uh, what I've shown here is we basically um, uh, used a, a, a super pro designer model. Work was done at MIT uh, by Greg Stephanopoulos' group, who's on our committee, uh, obviously under the input from all of our committee. A model that had been developed and trained on grain ethanol. Pot and kettle process, this is a pot and kettle process. So we got the equipment priced right, you can size the units and the operating variables are priced right. We took that model and modified it for legal cell, cellulose ethanol at 40, uh, at 40 million gallons a year, which is a million and a half tons of feed a year. It, it really a relatively small plant. Uh, we 
we, we focused on uh, pretreatment yields uh, and the cellulase cost, which are numbers that we basically developed by talking to people where we thought that, for example, the enzyme cost, where it would be in 20, uh, say, next couple of years with these commercial demonstrations. And then we actually scaled it about how we thought the technology would develop. Uh, in the first two columns, you see this is reduction cost of ethanol on a gasoline equivalent basis. So we took the ethanol cost, divided by 0.66, and uh, $4 a gallon uh, to $3 a gallon by 2020 on a gasoline equivalent basis. The issue of scale here, you see we went up, we went up to 100 million tons, uh, 100 million gallons a year plant. Uh, which is 4,000 tons a day, which we sort of think is sort of the optimal size design plant, and the cost fell some. But these processes are not nearly as scalable as more heavy industry processes like gasification. So what this shows is it shows that the cost will come down quite a bit between now and 2020 for technology that's deployable, assuming all these commercial demonstration plans are put in place. And that scale does play a factor. It's not as dominant a factor as you might have thought, but the size of the plant becomes so. So the, the biomass availability becomes a very important part of this. And by the way, um, I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, at the thermal conversion, um, I already described it talking about coal. And, and I'm not going to really discuss coal availability. Uh, other than when I talk about supply numbers later, I will talk about how much coal was required to do some of this. Uh, indirect liquefaction of coal, which is gasification of coal or biomass or combinations, followed by Fischer trope synthesis, uh, which makes diesel, basically, or by methanol to gasoline, which makes gasoline, basically. Those technologies are commercially available. Uh, and uh, they're deployable now. They've been basically more or less scaled up. But what hasn't been scaled up in part of this is the integration of these technologies, particularly coal, which generates twice as much carbon uh, and CO2 emissions as petroleum with carbon capture and sequestration. Those things have not been scaled up. And so uh, in our deployable analysis, we basically assumed that carbon capture and sequestration integrated with gasification plants would be demonstrated and commercially available in the 2015, 2016 time frame so commercial plants could be designed and built, which would be integrated plants. Um, it's, a very, it's a very important assumption here. It was discussed, discussed all the time. Obviously, there is a, there is a, 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 a accelerated program, the DOE, to do this. It's been mentioned many times today what an important aspect of our, of our low carbon energy future uh, this is. So what do these results look like? Uh, I just took three examples uh, of the thermochemical conversion of biomass and combined bio biomass with assumptions. Uh, the first one, the CTL, Fischer tropes, with carbon capture and sequestration. We did this, we did this work at, with Bob Williams' group in Princeton. Uh, this, 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 let me just go down, go down the first column. Uh, 26,000 tons a day of coal, you can build a large plant. By the way, this is three times bigger than a traditional coal-fired gas uh, uh, coal -fired power plant. Very big plant. Uh, making 50,000 barrels a day of liquid. Uh, 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 with a break-even uh, oil price of about $68 a barrel. And the Fisher tropes liquids uh, derived emissions, let me just go this word. The one means that the CO2 emissions from this process is the same as the CO2 emissions that would be generated by gasoline from petroleum. That's what one means. If you didn't have CCS with this, it would have been two. It would have been twice as high. If we combine the fissiotropes, we combine the biomass and coal, as I said before, in a 60-40 ratio, uh, we can't build as large a plant because we are basically limited by biomass supply. So we end up building a plant that only makes 50,000, or about 10,000 barrels a day of coal. Uh, 
but it has no carbon emissions with a CCS, basically a combination of CCS and the biomass basically consuming. <laughs> and finally, uh, with, with biomass to liquids of fisiotropes to CCS uh, to the same size plant, uh, you can actually have negative C CO2. So you basically are absorbing the combination of the biomass and this. So on the bottom line, you get a projection of very positive movement on carbon-based fuels. On the middle line, which talks about capital intensity of the plant, you see that the plant goes up a lot in carbon because these processes are very, very capital intensive. And you can see the break-even price for oil goes from $68 to $139. So there is a trade-off of this. So what I've shown here is basically the foundation work that was done in order to put the system together on a common basis of feedstock and cost and carbon emissions. And that's what Jim's going to talk about now. And then I want to come back and close with some issues and discuss the barriers to implementing all this. Thank you, Mike. Um, there's a bottom line. I, of the process that, and I know a lot of people out here, and we've talked about the, the value of understanding processes from many different disciplines. Think about what Mike has just said about what you really need to understand this part of the system. You really have to understand the agricultural issues and the land availability. You have to understand what's gonna be happening with, with crops, of both the, the cost issue, what it really takes to grow crops, and what farmers are going to be motivated. Then you need to understand the physical thermo, uh, processes of the thermochemical conversion and, uh, or the biochemical conversion. Then you have to understand the economics of competition between oil and, and the uh, various processes. Uh, one of the things for me that was very personally gratifying was to see that after getting through the, the problem of everybody in each discipline uses different units and how they describe things and getting past the issue of tons, T-O-N-N-E-S versus T-O-N-S of carbon uh, versus uh, uh, people who like to talk in terms of terawatts of energy versus BTUs versus tons of coal, you really can do a process in which the output is greater than the sum of the parts, the intellectual output is greater than the sum of the parts, but you really need to get this sort of interdisciplinary approach. I guess the second gratifying thing is Mike said he, he appreciated being back on on campus now, and when given the intensity of the study, at the end I said, you know, I appreciate being back on campus now. <laughs> it was just a, a, a tremendous amount of time and effort as, as uh, Lenore could testify to what he's doing. Um, so let's jump into some of the first cost estimates, and I want to bring your attention to um, these are a, a set of cost estimates where we look at the life cycle cost over a group of the various technologies. Uh, this would be cellulosic uh, ethanol. This, this would be biomass to liquids um, with a thermal process. This is coal, uh, Fischer-Tropes coal, um, methanol to, to gasoline process. And over here we have the equivalent crude oil price, because we believe that ultimately for this, these systems to come in place, they have to p compete with oil. Oil is the dominant form of energy in the United States, and unless we have costs that are in the ballpark with and compete successfully with, with oil, we'll have wonderful technological concepts which never get implemented. Um, bottom line is a lot of these uh, look more costly than, than, than oil. Uh, if we have oil at $60 a barrel, 
If oil turns out $100 a barrel, still many of them are more costly. So although the technologies can be developed, they may not be implemented under the assumption we have here. And what is that assumption? That we don't treat seriously the carbon price, uh, creating a carbon price. There is no price of carbon in these numbers that I've given. It's what would happen, what would be the estimates if we did not create a cap and trade system or a carbon price system, we tr allowed carbon to be an unpriced externality in this system. And my translation is that um, very few of these, other than the coal-based uh, strategies, are not actually going to compete. The biomass systems are not going to compete. And if you look at the life cycle emissions, Mike suggested here's gasoline. And a lot of these opportunities, particularly coal-based, would move us in exactly the wrong direction for carbon dioxide. They start putting in significantly more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If we have a biomass system, we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere but notice the cost of that, very high cost, and it's not economically going to work. Um, however, although we didn't discuss the policies, in fact, there is a policy issue the United States is facing. Are we serious about creating a carbon price through either a cap and trade system or a carbon tax? Here we've used, um, quite arbitrarily, a $50 per ton of carbon dioxide, not of carbon, but of, of carbon dioxide. Heftier price, and it's about twice the price that you see in the European markets right now. Um, but in 2020, I think it's a price that's not out of the range of what we, we could be seeing. And it suggests that what this would do is increase the cost of gasoline sharply increase the cost of these coal-based alternatives. And the way we've got to translate these biomass, anytime we see the gray here, the top of this bar has to be reduced by that amount. Um, Microsoft uh, diagrams uh, don't allow us to show that very effectively. So think of subtracting this from the top of those curves. So with a carbon cap and trade system, we start getting some of these technologies that within the area of uncertainty may be able to compete quite effectively with oil in, in the overall market. Um, so let's go back to the supply curves. One thing that I believe that is an important methodological notion is when we're estimating new technologies is you can't just tell the cost of something or you can't just say how much you can could produce. You've got to say something about how much you can produce at what cost. It's the supply curve concept. Because we, we know that a lot of technologies, or a lot of things, we can implement at niche levels. At maybe a low cost. People want to throw things away. Niche costs. Uh, niche markets at low cost don't solve any societal problems. So you start, you've got to start looking at, at the supply curve. Here we have the supply of cellulosic ethanol. And we just bring you, the units are millions of barrels of gasoline today, uh, gasoline equivalent per day. Now, there's more ethanol than that, but we scaled it down by the BTU uh, um, per unit, maybe uh, Chris Edwards would like us to do, uh, the, he scaled it down by exergy, but we scaled it down by relative BTUs each. And we started looking at the, the various uh, um, supplies, and it suggests that if the crude oil price was as high as $100 a barrel, we cut off at the area of about a million and a million six, 1.6 million barrels per day of oil. Remember, comparing it to the 20 million barrels a day of oil that we use. Um, how might I inter interpret this? 
It's not a silver bullet. But it's not just silver bird shot. It's probably silver buck shot. We got a significant chunk of it. It makes a difference, but it, along with other things, can be um, an important part of the solution. Uh, that's if we stay strictly uh, with, with the use of, of, uh, bio, uh, of the plant materials, of the biologically derived uh, materials. We, we maybe think about in the order of million and a half barrels per day if we expect oil prices to be as high as $100 a barrel. But if we're thinking about $60 a barrel, we may be able to produce half a million barrels a day that will be economically complete. Now think about what this means about the, we didn't make any policy conclusions, but you can make some projections. With high uncertainty about the crude oil prices, where you don't know whether it's gonna be $60 or, or $100 or more or less, and you've gotta invest a very large amount of money in these plants, and you want to try to motivate the farmers to start planting very different crops than they've done in the past under the expectation that they can sell them. The uncertainty in crude oil price starts becoming very important to the overall problem area. What happens, though, if you're willing to accept the possibility of using a most abundant fossil fuel, and that's coal? in combination with the biomass. And Mike suggests that these were uh, coal in combination with the biomass in a way that we can um, reduce the carbon dioxide uh, that would be released down to uh, basically zero if we have carbon capture and storage. And it suggests that, let's look at this upper line these are, these are costs if we did not have carbon capture and storage. So in carbon capture and storage, if we assume a $50 per ton of carbon dioxide price, so it, it increases the price of gasoline, it's saying, well, maybe competitive at $100 a barrel, we could maybe get 2.5 million barrels per day. So it says the, the willingness to take coal in the mix with, with the biological fuels, with the, with the biomass, starts enhancing, increasing significantly what you're able to be, be producing. Um, at $60 a barrel, though, none of this is going to be competitive, absent carbon capture and storage. With carbon capture and storage, though, and $50 a ton of carbon dioxide, then what we, we end up having is, is a situation in which once we start scaling this around, that the um, estimated cost relative to the gasoline uh, is, is then reduced to the system. And even at $100 a barrel, we can maybe going out in the order of three, three and a half million barrels a day. So what this suggests to me is that once you're able to get some combination of, of coal and biomass in the system and do the engineering right, and that takes some engineering, which is be out of, outside of my pay grade, um, then there is some really good opportunities, but again, only if you have success in carbon capture and storage and only if you're willing to put a carbon carbon tax on the system. Um, and so let me turn it back to Mike here. I noticed that, that the time is going rapidly, so, and I'll let Mike be the one that's between you and the drinks. 5.30. And here's the pointer. Okay, well, I just have three more slides. Here's the pointer back. Okay. Um, the supply numbers he showed were theoretical supply. In other words, it assumed all the plants were in place to convert them in place, uh, and uh, so the other thing we did is we looked at how fast we thought you could actually build the plants, how many plants was the real engineering piece of this. And while the numbers all kind of sound like 
his number. These are the actual rates at which we thought this stuff can be deployed. Uh, soy elastic ethanol, bioconversion, uh, a, half a, a half a million barrels a day of gasoline by 2020, and then something close to two million barrels a day of gasoline by 2035. Uh, that would consume most of the 500 million barrels. Now, to do that number, and how we did this magic, is we looked at the, the rate of increase of corn ethanol in this, the heyday of corn ethanol plants, uh, which was 25% a year, and we doubled it to 50% a year, and we doubled the size of the plants. Uh, and that took us to about 2 million barrels a day in 2035. It takes a long time to build. These are 400 plants have to be permitted, built, and people have to get contracts with biomass suppliers. So it takes time. It takes time to turn over this energy system. When you combine coal and biomass to liquids, uh, we did the same kind of analysis with the same kind of what we thought were very rapid assumptions, and we could get up to 2.5 million barrels a day of gasoline by 2035, 25 years, 25 years from now. That's where the conclusion came from in uh, Chancellor's uh, uh, right in, uh, right in, uh, presentation this morning that petroleum is going to be a major demand item for a long period of time. And coal to liquids, we built two to three plants a year. You can get two to three million barrels a day, uh, but it would take a 50% increase in coal production. If you just look at these things, uh, the coal to biomass gasification plants require 300 plants to do that between now and 35. We haven't built a refinery in this country since 1970. Uh, and, the, and the coal to liquid fuels plants would, uh, would take about 60 plants that are three times larger than the largest coal plants being built in the United States today or haven't been built. There's a massive, massive infrastructure issue that we require first policy to drive uh, decisions and, and so forth. The barriers to me, and I think I speak for the committee, but the biggest barrier here is organizing the ag industry to produce, fuel, to produce biomass that will create zero carbon fuels, which means the, the farmers and the ag industry would have to get organized. They would have to have, they, their, their biomass would have to be certified which means they were producing it the right way. They would have to be organized to collect it. They would have to be organized in order to how to, uh, enough that people would build 20-year contracts. I mean, when I used to have another life, I can't imagine trying to build a plant. You have a 20-year con. We built an LNG plant. We have to have a 25-year contract in order to get the gas. So it has to be a tremendous organization of the ag industry and probably also a development of technology like single-pass tilling uh, or no tilling at all. The second is, uh, and maybe in some ways it's another very, it, it's the implementation of commercial demonstration plants for coal demonstration with CCS. This stuff has to go on rapidly. Uh, and it was discussed today, this stuff has not gone on very well in the Department of Energy in the past. Uh, megaton storage of, of storage, uh, of geological storage in order not only to um, show the technology works, but to measure uh, the CO2 and make sure that we actually can get things permitted, uh, developing a more efficient pretreatment and improving enzymes. And as I talked about in these processes, the most important thing for ethanol is a pretreatment process and cost effective uh, very, uh, uh, enzymes, permitting the constructions of tens to hundreds of conversion plants and approaches that recognize, as Jim said, commodity prices and especially prices will vary all over the place. And what are the guarantees for investors to build these plants? These are major, major issues for this society to address. For that, this study says you get two to three million barrels a day of fuel uh, out of 12 million barrels a day used in transportation. While that number might seem small to you, if you combine a 30% improvement in the efficiency of internal combustion engines, uh, which is certainly feasible with technology today over the next 15 years, you could literally cut U.S. oil imports by 50%. And that's a much bigger objective. 
and that would play a large role in, in improving U.S. energy security and would also de decrease our carbon footprint. So the final conclusion is the same one I just said, liquid transportation fuels have potential to supply two to three million barrels a day, can play an important role in addressing our energy future and also our carbon future. Uh, commercial deployment demonstrations are extremely important and investor confidence uh, will require some kind of carbon price and also to, to lead to specific re reductions in, in greenhouse gas emissions. So that's it. We'll be let me just my one word of, of, of summary in here. Uh, for those people I talk with who think that biomass in liquids is a panacea, this study said, uh-uh, it's not going to be a panacea. For those that say it's not worth doing, it said, uh-uh, it's still significant. But when we end up, as Mike suggested, if we don't pay attention to how we use the energy, the demand side, then this doesn't really make enough difference to, to really rock the system. This in combination of energy efficiency, what you do on the demand side, is, is part of how we can really start moving ahead and dealing this conundrum of liquid fuels for transportation. Maybe once another thing, if you convert the sugars, you don't convert them to ethanol, but you convert them to something else by biological processes or catalytic processes, you have the same limitations. Yeah. Biomass is still the limitation. Pre-treating the biomass is a limitation, and the, and the, and the, the uh, enzymes uh, to hydrolyze the, the uh, cellulose and hemicellulose is still the limitation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Steve Cadivar, Civil Engineering, Stanford alumni, currently with the Tra Department of Transportation. Uh, two questions. Uh, in this model, the wealth and income redistribution uh, has not been addressed, I suppose. No. No, from, not at all. From farmer to oil companies? No. Second, um, in terms of environmental assessment, uh, what would be the impact of transportation of the raw material to the plant? Would there, will there be an effect of CO2? We, in calculating the CO2 impact, we tried to do the estimation of the CO2 cost of moving everything in the system. So when we showed the CO2 by balance, we took the, how much CO2 we were taking out of the atmosphere by growing the plants, how much we were putting into it from the petroleum products for growing it from the fertilizer, how much we were putting into it from transportation, how much we could uh, end up sequestering, and then how much was going back into the atmosphere with combustion. Did we do it all well without any mistakes? Of course we made mistakes, but those we tried to put into the, those overall numbers. Oh, you know, on bioconversion, on, on uh, biomass bioconversion, most of the CO2 problems are, in the, are around the plant. And uh, uh, on coal, though, uh, the answer to your question on coal, we did not look at the issues of mining and transporting coal. Other studies have done that. Yeah. We pointed out that in the combined coal biomass, you'd have, to, you'd have to increase U.S. coal production by 25 percent, which is a whopping number, uh, which has its own kind of environmental footprint. And we did not have time to look at that. And those are very serious issues. Thanks. I see one in the, in the back. Uh, back uh, in the right corner is the blue. No, no. To you. Right behind you. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Must be uh, thank you for your talk. And when you're looking at feedstock supplies, um, have have you looked at 
what it would take to partner with the Bureau of Land Management or Forestry <clears throat> or any of the states uh, to derive your feedstock just from publicly owned lands, what it would take in, in addition to that material that's already creating a problem in the system to begin with. The, um, the woody biomass included some things from, in fact, we had people in land management actually came in and talked to us on the woody biomass side. Uh, those were thinnings. Those thinnings represented part of the stuff that was on federal lands. Uh, but I must tell you that the next phase of this, or people who are a lot smarter than we are, is that organizational look at all the lands. And one thing I did mention is we did an, another part of this study uh, where we actually looked at distribution of biomass in the United States, including woody biomass and all on, on areas and, and municipal waste. And the concentration of biomass in a 40-mile radius uh, will vary from 10,000 uh, 10, tons a day to 500 tons a day. So there's a whole variability factor that we did not look at that requires land management and a lot of other people. That, and we have recommendations in the study that those things need to proceed. It, just as a follow-up, it seems to me that if you were looking at this as a temporary fix over the next 20 years or so, that by 2035, 2040, there would certainly be, <clears throat> hopefully, um, better technologies than biomass, um, especially with a coal assist. So <clears throat> wouldn't it... It seems to me that this is sort of a closed loop problem in terms of biomass and that if you were to look at the feedstock available over the next 20 years that it might not be as daunting. Um, well, I don't think this is a, I mean, I think this is sustainable biomass production. This is sustainable fuels. I think that the part of this that might not be sustainable is ethanol. But we heard today, and we know a lot, a lot of work is going on to convert those sugars to more co uh, compatible fuels. So I don't think this is a temporary fix. Uh, I think that the energy future, we're talking about transportation, is a very mixed energy future where you'll have things like hydrogen, you'll have oil, and you'll have a lot of other sources of energy that will be needed. Uh, but I don't see this as a closed loop. Maybe the ethanol is. And we remember what Nate Lewis was pointing out, that, that plants in their natural form are pretty inefficient in converting solar radiation to, to things that you can use to capture it. Um, you have to postulate that you can greatly increase the rate of that conversion uh, so they become much more efficient and that you do that in, you know, in a relative, and you can do it in a very large scale. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's really the assumption that you have to make in order to believe that you'll get a lot more uh, than this from the biomass. I was a little curious what went into your numbers, uh, especially for your break-even price at Cole de Fisher Tropes Liquids at $68 a barrel. That number kind of surprised me. What sort of return did you assume? Uh, is it, you know? Well, it's got a 12% uh, return, right? It, 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 yeah, I think it, it was, was uh, something like 12.5% uh, 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 rate this of This has contingency in it for design and everything? I mean, this is... Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we actually, you know, we went to uh, uh, Bob Williams and we, Jim Katzer did all this modeling. So he actually knows how to do all that stuff you're talking about. And so we had some contingency numbers. We did not use what the environmental community used, used as return rates for 5 or 6%. We used more of a refinery, even though, Paul, we know we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, approve a project at 12% return. We used a, more of a, a realistic return. We had some contingency in it. What we did not have was startup cost and other factors in there. These were and, and plant well, and, as yeah. assumptions. And we actually debated that question a lot, Paul. How do we do that? 
Uh, hi, uh, Karim Farhat from the Energy Resources Engineering Program at Stanford. So if you can just briefly uh, tell us about the technical or the economic uh, difficulties that you had and that prevented you from incorporating the algae as biomass. Because, I mean, as you know, it, like, it, it, it usually it's considered because uh, its, it's uh, growth rate is very high, so that contributes positively to the CO2 that it takes, and at the same time, it has higher tolerance for CO2 concentrations than other plants, so. Uh, well, you know, these studies are kind of pragmatic and you have so much money. So uh, uh, the first thing we did, we debated what fuels. We had, we had algal fuels and we had ethanol. Uh, we took a look at the available data that was actually out there we could even start with and since the technology had not developed even far enough to understand where you would make it in closed containers or where you would make it in open fields or whether or not the actual microorganisms had been developed to actually get the yield rates we wanted, we basically concluded that from a technical deployable standpoint, that wasn't technically deployed by 2020. It did not mean that we do not believe that's a very important activity. And as I mentioned, the president of synthetic genomics was on our team. And so, uh, and that's what they're doing. Uh, so I think it's a very, very important avenue. It's just something we didn't do. Uh, could we have done it? I'm not sure we had the information to do it openly like uh, you're talking about. That's why we didn't do it. It's just for a pragmatic reason. Yeah. In, in addition, we're so concerned about water supply for those uh, al algal uh, farms that use fresh water as opposed to salt water. I have two questions. I have two questions. First, uh, uh, there was little attention to the capability of the country to supply the science and engineering capabilities to implement a program to 2020 or 2035. Isn't, isn't there, was there any attention to the availability of the correct science and engineering capabilities, first question. Second question, there was little attention or mention of coal to liquids or biomass to liquids by other nations. In China, there already are coal to liquid plants running, both via gasification of coal and also by direct liquefaction of coal in a 50,000 barrel a day operation. In the end, will we have to buy our technology from China? No. Uh, we did pay attention to gasification, and we know those plants are being built. And we said they were commercial deployable, and that we could integrate gasific coal gasification plants with Fisher Tropes or methanol or gasoline today. And, we, and that's done, and I think we know that. And we actually used those types of estimates to make our cost estimates. Uh, I probably wasn't clear enough when I presented. What we said was not deployable was the integration of this technology with carbon capture and sequestration operate in integrated mode that we thought would have to be demonstrated before we could start permitting these plants in 2015. So yes, I agree with you uh, that those plants are being built. Uh, and uh, you know, they, they, there's enough known down to design those plants on an integrated basis at a 50,000 barrels a day. So yes, I agree and we actually would use that information. We did not look at the first question, which is obviously extremely important. We were not asked to. You know, we sort of, you have to live in your guidelines of, of what we're asked to do and how much time. The whole issue of the engineering skills, and not only the but, but scientific, the engineering skills, uh, or the, the ability to do this, and, and simple things as building 400 plants over 20 years and the engineering capability, the construction capability, the permitting capability, we didn't look at any of that, and that's obviously a very, very important barrier. There's going to be follow-up studies uh, on this. They're raising the money now. It's called, and some of these really co more complicated issues are going to be focused in in a more narrow area. So it's a very good question, but I, we did not look at the first one. The second one, we, we knew that, and we put that into this study. We're yeah. also trying to think about those things that reduce the amount of carbon put in the atmosphere rather than increasing the carbon. So we have one last uh, question, and then, uh, then we can uh, have the remaining questions over a glass of something. 
thank you for your talk. Um, was there any component of your analysis that introduced an X factor um, regarding other industries moving in and predating upon these systems as they come available? For instance, uh, pharmaceutical industry moving in to derive feedstocks for their precursors or whatnot. Um, this could potentially help push the price of these analyses significantly one way or the other. Thank oh, you. One thing that we didn't do, but, and, but, but is a very important consideration, we're saying, we're assuming that we're using all this biomass for liquids. But the other alternative way of using it is for generating electricity. And so that any of the biomass that we use for generating electricity directly will not be able to be used for the, bio, for the liquid fuel. So that is an area where we said this is, this is the explicit assumption that we're going to use it all that way and recognize, recognize that um, every, every, every um, mil, million ton that you use uh, for for electricity, is a million ton less of biomass that you can use this way. But we didn't use any of the other, in the, look at any of the other industries. We had a very interesting, that's coming, we had a very interesting debate with Lynn's team, which was the fossil fuel part of the study, because they wanted to use the biomass for electricity and we wanted to use it for fuels. And if you look in our report, there's a box that we write special comments, and that box says there are a few options for developing zero carbon fuels if you don't use biomass. There are a lot of other options for making low carbon electricity. And so we punt, we take it for fuels. <laughs> be, be, besides, besides, we're the ones giving the presentation here and he's yeah. not. <laughs> okay, so please join me in thanking these, uh, our speakers. Okay. Thanks. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.